topic as we can and make sure we give Keith enough time for his presentation. Um, so this first presentation will be by Keith Robinson. And he's going to be talking about incorporating the next generation of water monitoring in Vermont. So Keith is currently the director of the New England Water Sciences Center for the USGS. Um, much of his professional experience is in the area of water quality studies, regional to national level assessments. Um, he has an interest in regional predictive modeling and methods to improve <coughs> tracking, cleaning water, and access progress. So please welcome Keith. Uh, we'll go about 10 minutes for his presentation, and you know, we'll you guys to ask some questions at the end. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give some ideas I've been kicking around for a while and some things that USGS is already doing in areas, but I want to talk about it in the context of how we can be collecting more efficient water data uh, to be used for things like achieving goals of clean water, act standards, or looking at non-sling source controls, and actually protecting public safety. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to give examples of three areas that USGS has been involved in. Oh, okay. I mean, to stimulate some thinking about areas uh, that might be relevant in Vermont. So moving in forward. Um, the first area is developing a science of continuous water quality monitoring to help with resource assessment. And I have a couple examples of work that USGS is doing. Yeah, we're going to have to shut the doors soon. <laughs> 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 Those folks have two extra pieces of dessert, is that where they're <laughs> um, But there's new technology in water monitoring that looks not only at things like temperature and pH and VO, but nitrate, uh, phosphates, and things like that, organic carbon. And I think there's the capability of using this technology just as we use stage monitoring in rivers to look at stream flow and all things like conductance in rivers. But using this to really get a better picture of what's happening with nutrients and these contaminants of concern on a real-time, continuous basis. And the first set of up <coughs> top is work that we're doing in the Connecticut River down towards the mouth south of Hartford, Connecticut, where we're monitoring continuous nitrate and continuous organic carbon in the Connecticut River. And nitrate's a big issue for um, Long Island Sound because nitrate's limiting, nitrogen is limiting the nutrient in Long Island Sound. So this information helps generate continuous concentrations and continuous loads of the nitrogen series in Long Island Sound, contributing to Long Island Sound. Um, because when you do fixed sampling or graph sampling once a month or whatever, you miss a lot of details that you wouldn't see if you had continuous data. And the second graph is work that's been done in our Kansas Water Science Center where they have a network of continuous water quality monitors um, co-located with stream gauges. And what they do is they've um, done graph sampling for phosphorus and other constituents. And they've developed a continuous uh, record of phosphate or phosphorus based on discharge and um, continu continuous turbidity. So they've developed a regression approach for estimating total phosphorus and other constituents of concern based on this continuous monitoring of flow and turbidity. And what this plot shows is, um, this is the blue line is a continuous discharge and then the black line is estimates of continuous total phosphorus. And it gives you error estimates. You can't see it too well, but it's shaded. It's the 90, 95th percentile, or the, um, the errors associated with the projections of total phosphorus. And so I think of things like this as like, wow, we've got the total phosphorus concern in Lake Champlain. We want to monitor what's going in Lake Champlain and other lakes and other water bodies. So if we could develop kind of estimates like that, we could get real-time estimates of phosphorus from the major tributaries going into Lake Champlain. And then you can relate it to things like, um, and this is an example that USGS is involved with in the Gulf of Mexico, the hypoxia. You've all heard about hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. And they've actually developed a tool where 
USGS measures the loads of nitrogen going into the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi, and they develop a predictive tool to show the, the, the hypoxia area that would be generated from these levels of nutrients. And so, is it too much of a stretch to think we could be doing continuous total phosphorus, other things like total sediment, going into Lake Champlain, and then developing relations to what we might see in Lake Champlain, whether it's in Mississippi Bay or other locations of the lake where we have nutrient impairment. So that we could say, okay, we've had a major storm event, or we've had uh, you know, record high flows and phosphorus um, contributions to Mississippi Bay. Here's what the impacts would be on Mississippi Bay. So we're making predictive assessments, and then we can go out and monitor and see if those things are happening. Or we can give early warnings, like we expect a, you know, uh, an algal bloom, where we expect phosphorus concentrations to be above a certain concentration based on these inflows. And I think, you know, with the tools that we're developing associated with the total maximum daily load process, where we're having an in-lake response model, um, we, we might be able to start to create these tools so that we can have a better predictive sense of the effect of what's going on in the watershed and how the lake is going to respond. Um, so that's one of the things I think would be hopeful to have a better predictive sense on what's happening with the uh, Lake Champlain watershed, other watersheds where you have uh, major impairments, and then trying to develop a response relationship. Um, that's one example. Oh, I forgot. But you know, we do have an um, through the Lake Champlain Basin Program in the states of New York and Vermont, we do have an extensive tributary monitoring program that's been going on for. <coughs> Uh, 25 years now, and so they have good relations with flow, but we don't really know if we've got all those characteristics really worked out in terms of you get a major peak runoff, are you really characterizing the loading appropriately with these major events? So, um, so having more continuous data helps to define the, the ends of those uh, conditions that you don't see all the time by doing the screen once a month or 18 times a year sample. Uh, another thing we've been doing to measure water quality is we use uh, USGS and others have developed the use of an acoustic Doppler current profile or a ADCP to measure stream flow. Uh, but what the ADCP gives you is it, it gives you backscatter associated, three minutes already? Oh my. Um, it gives you backscatter associated with sediment. And so um, from that measurement, you can get estimates of sediment. And this is work that we've done with DEC, Ben Holpins, and Neil's group to estimate the backscatter we see with the ADCP and estimates of sediment concentration. So you could be measuring stream flow and sediment concentrations at the same time. And in some areas, they can use this to develop measures of phosphorus. We're doing some work in the Rock River where we are showing relations to phosphorus. Um, Flooding is another area that we're seeing a lot of activities in New England and Vermont, you all know. But another technology that's being developed is the use of flood inundation maps. And this is really for protecting public safety, being prepared for floods, knowing what areas are going to be inundated when you have um, flows of a certain condition. And what this, how this works is uh, USGS monitoring gauge is used by the National Weather Service to develop a flood prediction for that point, that stream. Um, based on those, on the Weather Service predictions, we've been developing these flood inundation maps, which show which areas are going to be inundated and at what depth associated with those flood loads. Um, we feel like this is a real helpful tool for communities to prepare for floods. Um, so that if the Weather Service says the stage is going to uh, we're predicting 15 feet. These are the areas that will be inundated at 15 feet. So the community has <coughs> some better information to make informed decisions in terms of emergency, emergency management and how to prepare for certain floods. And these are all stored on a, um, a web page, so you can get access to that at any time. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in one minute is um, <laughs> in another example that USGS is doing, looking at groundwater contaminants. And we've all heard about arsenic and groundwater. For USGS in New England, we've done a series of, of studies looking at arsenic and groundwaters 
in New England, New Hampshire, in the Northeast. And we've developed predictive models to say what areas are more susceptible to arsenic in groundwater. Um, and I think this is a real useful tool, uh, not only at the national level and the regional level, but could help emergency, I mean, local planners, uh, local health officials, health departments to figure out where should they monitor for contaminants of concern in public water supplies. Most people, there, there's no requirements to test their domestic well, for instance. Um, and in New Hampshire, we estimate that 20% of the population is using domestic wells uh, that have arsenic higher than the, the 10 microgram per liter standard. So developing more predictive tools for these contaminants will help inform public decision and uh, policies for uh, protecting public health. And not only is arsenic a concern, but things like manganese and iron also have potential health effects that should be looked at if we can develop some more maps for those. So that's real quick. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to field for him? Yes. Um, Stream stream gauge monitoring in Vermont. Uh, I don't think Lake Champlain Basin picked it up. Who's going to pay for it this year? The, the, the basin program. Uh, oh, I don't know. Is the basin program going to pay for it? Who's stream it's, gauge monitoring in Vermont? Where's the funding this year? Uh, it never seems to be doing, dedicated. We worked out an arrangement where um, there's more dedicated funding. The gauging in Vermont comes from multiple agencies in the state, and the USGS provides some matching funds, and also funds from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. So we, last year, we came up with a plan to fund the gauges, and I think it's pretty stable for now. All right, I think we have time for one more question before you guys move on. Yes. Um, just to stick to the top of area of finances, have you found that the, um, the in-stream uh, phosphorus and nitrogen measurements is more cost-effective than Doing discrete sampling? Yeah. Um, I think it gives you a more complete picture of the conditions. Um, phosphorus by itself is not an expensive thing to measure. It's the manpower it takes to go to go out there. I think once you, you're going to have to do some discrete sampling to help calibrate and validate that. But I think you have to decide, is it worth having that full picture of, of potential loss? And I think in an area where you have uh, conditions dominated by runoff and high flow events like you do Lake Champlain, you can't capture that with uh, discrete sampling. So I think if you really want to manage a resource, you have to really know the upper ends of those loads that you might see. Okay? And I think you're spending millions of dollars on management. It's going to cost a little bit more to do that type of work, but hopefully it's going to, they're going to understand your system a lot better. Okay. Let's give another round of applause.